again. Welcome everyone. We've got a very good attendance this morning and it's really my pleasure to serve as the introducer and the moderator of the session. So let me give you a little background about our presenter whom I have known for more than 40 years uh, as Tani, uh, though he officially he's Dr. Natan Menachem Meir and he is the chair of the Harold Schnitzer Family Program in Judaic Studies at Portland State University, where he has been on the faculty since 2008. He has grown the Judaic Studies program so that is now offered as a major for students at the university. Um, he's a very esteemed historian who has recently, he published a book some years ago called Kiev, and he's recently published a new book called Stepchildren of the Shtetl. Um, and we are gonna learn with him today about a very curious ritual, which is called uh, alternatively, uh, the, uh, the Black Wedding, the Cholera Wedding, it's uh, a time of plague and an interesting ritual that some Jewish communities enacted to rid themselves of a plague. And it seemed a very fitting topic for us today while we are still living with the ongoing coronavirus pandemic, though we are now able to be more optimistic about seeing the end of it. So um, we are scheduled for 90 minutes. Uh, Professor Mayer will- And now they can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions. So I'm gonna ask you to put your questions in the chat. Hopefully everybody knows how to use that. I'll monitor the chat. And at a certain point when he pauses and invites questions, I will read some of the questions to him. Okay, I think we're ready to go. So good morning all and welcome. And let's begin. Thanks, Elaine, for that really lovely introduction. It's good to be with everyone today, back at Beth Shalom. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces. And I'm, I'm very happy to, uh, to share this lecture with you. Um, it is, as Elaine said, part of uh, the research for my most recent book, which I'm hoping you can see right now on the screen. Mm -hmm. That's, um, as Elaine said, Stepchildren of the Shtetl, the Destitute, Disabled, and Mad of Jewish Eastern Europe, 1800 to 1939. And it's, uh, it's an investigation of the, the lives and the roles of the outcasts of the Jewish community in Eastern Europe. And so this, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is one aspect of that. It's uh, one chapter, actually more than one chapter in the book. And... As we speak, I'm actually writing a, um, a book proposal for a whole book on the cholera wedding or the plague wedding. I don't know if that will actually come to fruition, but there is a lot of material. Um, and I'll give you a, um, a taste of that today. So I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about the um, the disease uh, that seems to have provided the context for the emergence of this strange ritual, and that was cholera, um, of which there were several pandemics in the 19th century and into the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and these were pandemics that. Uh, really well, as the name suggests, uh, went all around the world. And several of them made it to the Russian empire, which is uh, where the Jews that we're concerned with were living. Um, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with, uh, with cholera. I actually, did, I mean, I had heard of it before, but I didn't really understand uh, how the disease worked uh, before I embarked on this project. Uh, so it's an, it's an intestinal infection which causes severe diarrhea and dehydration. 
And one of the scariest things about cholera is that it takes its effect so quickly on the human body. Um, so someone could be healthy in the morning and sick at night and dead by the next morning. This is obviously um, a terrifying disease, uh, especially as it ripped through communities and um, felled very large uh, numbers of people. So as I mentioned, there were several pandemics, in fact, um, seven in total. And uh, in some ways, cholera is actually a, a modern pandemic because the spread of the disease was made possible by the, the modern, uh, modern innovations like uh, new kinds of ships that could move more quickly uh, later on in the 19th century trains, of course, and the growing cities in the 19th century um, in Europe, but also in, in the Americas uh, that, um, that concentrated people into uh, very dense populations. And of course, we know that was particularly true for poor people. Um, who lived with, uh, with very poor conditions, including poor sanitation and lack of access to clean drinking water, which is exactly what gives rise to the spread of cholera. Now, of course, for most of the 19th century, people did not know that. Um, so there were various theories about how cholera could spread. It was the, uh, the miasma theory that there were certain um, humors in the air uh, that could depend on the, the kind of ground that people lived on. If it was swampy, people believed that that might, uh, that might make them susceptible to cholera. And there were also beliefs about what you ate or what you, what you drank that, uh, that could give you cholera as well. And you can see here this uh, handbill on the lower right-hand corner. Uh, this was distributed in New York City in 1832. Um, there was a cholera, the first cholera pandemic was the late, late 1820s into the early 1830s. Um, and we're gonna, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, what happened in the Russian empire uh, in a few minutes in that particular pandemic. But here in New York, you can see that the handbill says, this is how you can uh, ward off cholera you have to be temperate in eating and drinking, avoid raw vegetables and unripe fruit, abstain from cold water when heated. Not really sure what that means, like either cold or it's hot, right? Um, but that's certainly true that, that abstaining from cold water that had not been boiled was probably a good idea. And above all, from ardent spirits. So that was another aspect of people's theories about cholera that uh, if you drank too much, that you could be susceptible to the disease. And very often cholera was associated in the popular imagination, and not only the popular imagination, but also among some health experts with, um, with moral character. And so when they saw that poor neighborhoods were getting hit very hard, they automatically assumed that it was because of the dissolute character of the pe people in those neighborhoods, uh, they're poor, they're filthy. Sometimes there were brothels in those neighborhoods as well. So often it was associated with sexual immorality. And as you can imagine, because those poor neighborhoods in many parts of the, of the world, not only in the United States, um, were populated by, uh, by minorities of various kinds, um, there was often as an association made there as well. So in the United States, that, uh, that connection is drawn with African-Americans and with Irish immigrants. Um, and in the Russian Empire, it's sometimes drawn with Jews, especially in the first pandemic in the early 1830s, um, when, it's, when there were uh, Jewish communities in the Pale of Settlement uh, that were hit um, extremely hard. Not that they weren't hit hard later on in later waves as well, but it seemed to observers at the time that, uh, that um, heavily Jewish towns like Berdichev, for example, uh, had extremely high mortality rates, which is true, and they um, they blamed that on the fact that Jews lived in very dense uh, dense um, dense agglomerations, 
and, uh, and on other aspects of, uh, of Jewish life. Now, I think it's important to point out, um, and this will, this will come into play later on when we talk about the cholera wedding and its meaning um, that generally, if we look at uh, Europe uh, and also even in various places in the Americas, um, there, were, there was a lot of mistrust of uh, the health authorities at the time just probably not that surprising because they, uh, their methods or their suggestions for how to combat the disease generally didn't work or worked very spottily because they didn't really understand the disease until the late 19th century. And so very often there was a, a perception among the, the poor that the elite were trying to uh, were, were trying to attack them somehow by means of the disease or using the disease as as an excuse in some way uh, to get at them. And uh, because people, when they were taken to cholera hospitals, generally died because there was there really was no uh, effective medication for them there. They tended to resist being taken to hospitals. And in St. Petersburg, for example, uh, there, were, there was an uprising against the police because police would go into houses and forcibly take people who were sick um, to the hospitals, which were known as charnel houses, as death houses. In Britain, there were riots because there was a conspiracy theory that people were being taken to cholera hospitals uh, for the purposes of being, for their, cor for their corpses to be used in medical experimentation. Um, so there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, popular resistance to what the government and the health authorities are trying to do when pandemic comes around. There, of course, are also many popular and magical remedies. Um, and in Russia, for example, uh, these included the magic circle, which is a very, very widespread tool um, in magic, that is you draw a circle around uh, a person or in this case, an entire town. And in that way you prevent the evil from entering into that circle. You can see here an image of the Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill who used this method, although obviously did not call it the magic circle, but it's, it's effectively the same thing. Circling Moscow in a motorcade um, this past April with, a, with an icon to try to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, there was another remedy, another magical remedy where you, you stole a particular part of a water mill. And we, we know that Jews sometimes did this as well. Um, that seems to have been connected to uh, the idea that a certain god of the water, uh, an evil god of the water would be, uh, would be somehow held back or was somehow made angered by this particular part of the watermill. And if you stole it, then the, the God's anger would be appeased. Now among Jews, of course, we know there were traditional remedies. Um, some of them we would call religious. Some of them we might call religio-magical because they kind of, um, they, they sit on the border between religion and magic. Jews were, uh, were encouraged to give Sadaka, they were told to check their mezuzot, which of course was very important as seen as, as protecting against evil. Uh, there were all kinds of different amulets that you could get from Baal Shem, for example, from, um, from shamanic um, Kabbalistic experts who were very, uh, very widespread among the Jews of Eastern Europe. There were rings made out of palm fronds that you could wear as a protector. Um, in some communities, we know that they try to find instances of sexual immorality among the members of the community because that was seen as being the cause of the disease. And then there's also what we're going to talk about today, which is the cholera wedding. So my theory about the cholera wedding, even though there are some, a couple of reports that, that uh, suggest that it was practiced in the late 1700s, um, I think it actually emerges in the 1830s during the, the first cholera pandemic. And it's described as 
the marriage of two orphans, usually two poor orphans, or sometimes just two poor people, in the um, in the cemetery, and that is known as a segula. That is known as a, a remedy to stop the epidemic. And the uh, the the evidence we have from the um, for the the 1831 epidemic is from a book of Hasidic tales. Uh, about the about uh, Rabbi Tzvi Hirsch of Rimanov, uh, one of the Hasidic sects in Eastern Europe. And you can see here uh, that we have the original Hebrew and then the, the English translation in the year 5591, which corresponds to 1831. There was a cholera epidemic, which also came to Rimanov. And they carried out the known remedy, Vasul Hasgula Hayidua of marrying a poor man to a poor maiden in the cemetery. And then the, the story continues, uh, it's not really relevant to us, but the story continues that the bride actually fell ill with cholera. And then thanks to a miraculous intervention of the Rebbe, she became well again, and they were able to proceed with the, uh, with the wedding. That's all we have there. Now, later on in the 19th century, um, and specifically here I'm talking from the 1860s onward, um, we know that the cholera wedding spread very widely in Eastern Europe. So we find it all over the Pale of Settlement, which is the part of the Russian Empire where Jews were required to live. We find it in the Kingdom of Poland, which is a, a, a little part of what had previously been uh, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth that survived into the 19th century that was under Russian rule. And we also find it in Austrian-ruled Galicia, which is Southern Poland. Um, and what's interesting in the second half of the 19th century is that the people who function as brides and grooms and the cholera wedding are now chosen from among the people who I call the marginals or the outcasts of the community. And these are these generally are beggars, uh, people with disabilities of various kinds, physical disabilities, um, what we would call uh, developmental disabilities, uh, people with mental illness who are often known as town fools. And usually or often there's a kind of uproarious uh, tone to the wedding. At least that's what we find in some of, uh, some of the evidence. It has a certain carnival aspect to it. Excuse me for one second. It also spreads to Eretz Yisrael, where we know there were um, several cholera weddings in the late, the late 19th century, and also the United States. Um, and the places where we have evidence of cholera weddings in the US are New York, Philadelphia, and Winnipeg. And ultimately, although uh, cholera eventually uh, goes away once it's once it's discovered that once the bacterium is discovered and people understand what it is that can prevent cholera, we then have uh, typhus and influenza epidemics after World War One, and we find uh, the the wedding ritual then comes back during that time. There's something of a lull in the 20s and the 30s, or the the late 20s and the 30s, and then it reemerges in a few places during the Holocaust. Um, I've given you here in the lower right a, uh, an illustration of the Black Wedding. This is a painting by, by Myra Kirschenblatt, who's the father of, of Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimblet. You may know that name. Uh, she's a, a well-known Jewish studies and performance studies scholar at, at NYU, and she's also the primary figure in the creation of the, the main exhibit at the Pauline Museum of the History of Polish Jews in Warsaw. And um, he, in late, late in life, um, Meyer Kirschenblatt uh, created a set of illustrations, set of paintings of his, uh, his hometown in Poland, including a black wedding, as it was sometimes called, because the, the chuppah was often black, although in this case it wasn't black, as you can see. Um, not, not clear that he actually viewed it himself, that he actually per, per, uh, was, was in a an attendee at a wedding, but he probably heard about it. Now, what? how can we explain the cholera wedding? Um, this is something that I spent a lot of time trying to figure out. 
um, it would seem that uh, that such a peculiar ritual could not just emerge um, whole in the early 19th century. You know, I thought to myself, there must be some sort of historical precedent for this, or the um, the people among whom Jews lived, the Christian Slavs, must have had some kind of similar ritual. Um, and generally, I looked in vain. So there are elements of the cholera wedding that do uh, that, that do come before this time, but not the cholera wedding itself as we know it in the 19th century. So essentially, I contend that it is an innovation, right? It's an innovative ritual that emerges at this particular time. And as you can tell from what I've told you already, my theory is that it also, uh, it develops over the 19th century. So it starts out with poor people or poor orphans, and then it kind of uh, gradually develops to include all of those outcasts that I, I mentioned earlier. Now, the, the most obvious explanation for it, and the one that's often given by either people who are involved in it or people who are trying to explain it or justify it, um, uh, and we have to accept this uh, to some extent, is that it's a great mitzvah uh, to marry off two people who otherwise might never be able to get married. Um, we know that in, in some of those explanations, the logic is that the community uh, had not done right by those people. Uh, and basically, it's the community acknowledging as a whole, we have, uh, we have not treated you well, Therefore, we're going to do this, this great mitzvah and marry you in this particular way. Um, and that will help to appease God's anger. That's the, that's the general logic of it. The question then becomes, why does it have to be in a cemetery, right? I mean, why couldn't they just marry them in a regular, in a regular ceremony? Because as we know, Jewish weddings never take place in cemeteries. Uh, and so there's a number of different explanations for that, which we'll, we'll, we'll come to. Um, another possible influence or another possible precursor of the, uh, the cholera wedding is that going all the way back to the culture of medieval Ashkenaz, which is where, in other words, medieval Germany, which is where the, the Jews of Eastern Europe trace their religious um, roots to, Right? The Jews of Germany who, who lived there in the Middle Ages um, ultimately ended up migrating over the course of centuries eastward to Eastern Europe. And so therefore the Jews of Eastern Europe are called Ashkenazi, although Ashkenaz is actually Germany originally. Um, we know that going back to medieval Ashkenaz, the prayer of an orphan was considered very, very efficacious. And so, for example, an orphan was often chosen to lead uh, the prayers, to lead the, the services at the end of Shabbat, because it, it was understood that, and this is probably because the orphan had been separated from his parents or one, one of his parents at an early age who were now in the other world, that he had a special connection to the other world and therefore um, that prayer would kind of make it across, if you like, um, more effectively. There's also a long tradition going back to ancient times of Jews praying in the cemetery, in the cemetery during uh, a time of crisis, which rabbis generally discouraged because they didn't like the idea of Jews thinking that they, they might be actually praying for intercession because that's forbidden. Um, but nonetheless, Jews continue to do that um, over and over and over again. And so the, the idea that you would go to the cemetery when there is a crisis is, has a very long standing one. So there's different elements of the cholera wedding that we can trace back. Um, and I'm going to, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm gonna move forward a little bit and come back to this because I wanna show you another element that, um, another precursor of the cholera wedding that I think my theory is, this is the, maybe the most important one of all. And this is a literary precursor to the cholera wedding. This is a Purim spiel called The Beggar's Farce that circulated widely in Eastern Europe, probably from the as early as the 1600s. But we know that it was still in circulation in the 19th century. 
And this is uh, Purim Spiel players who uh, dress up as two beggars. And the idea is that the beggars are going to get married. And it's, a, it's an uproarious comedy. Um, and mo mostly because everyone is laughing at the beggar couple. And this is an opportunity to kind of take the, uh, the people who are the outcasts of the community, put them at, at the center and, um, and laugh at all the ways in which they are unusual um, or deviant in some ways. Uh, and so this is, we have this in, uh, in Yiddish. We have the text thanks to this scholar who you see on the bottom of the screen, uh, Yitzchak Schipper or Ignacy Schipper, who lived in, um, in Russian Poland and then in independent Poland in the, the late 19th, early 20th century. Um, as you can tell from the dates, he was murdered in the Holocaust. And he, he wrote a number of different works of Jewish history, both economic history, but also cultural history. And so we have uh, this from his, his history of um, Jewish theater which of course, as you can imagine, has a great deal about the, the Purim spiel. And the beggar's farce text we have here, um, essentially first we have the engagement where we have an, an, a Zeta, an old grandfather who addresses the beggar couple. Um, and he says, these are the Tanoim, uh, and then basically insults them. You are both totally ignorant Jews, which is Goise Goyim in Yiddish. Um, these are the garments, Ela uh, Habgodim, Kdachas Mitkoi Shirafodim, which is basically a, a Yiddish phrase, which means nothing at all, but it has a reference to Kdachas, which is a disease. Uh, the dowry is 450 score demons, Ruches is demons. Um, where, do they, where are they going to live? Of course, in Hekdesh, in the poorhouse. And the Hekdesh, by the way, is another very important aspect of my book, Stepchildren of the Shtetl, because the, the poorhouse was a very ubiquitous institution in Eastern Europe that we don't hear very much about, um, but it existed in almost every shtetl. Mzoinas, maintenance, they're gonna be beggars, which is what they do now, of course. Um, a position at the cemetery. So there's a connection here already to the cemetery because beggars often stood at the cemetery. Uh, it was a very good place to beg because people who came to the cemetery to visit graves often wanted to give tzedakah when they, when they went there. Um, and then all is valid and binding. Then we have the actual wedding itself, which as you'll see here, basically intersperses insults to the couple with the traditional wedding utterance of the groom, Hareyat mekudeshet li batabas zukadash moishe v'yisroel. I hereby wed you, you two blemishes, on you, my child, the plague, and on the lout, your, in other words, your, your groom too. May the lout burn like straw, may you both be bitten by the cat. Um, as a dog lies, and there's a Ukrainian phrase in here as well. Um, you should lie in the poorhouse bed, another reference to the hektish. You should both swell up like a barrel. And then the last line is very significant for us. Um, in the Yiddish, it says, May you both be punished. Right? It's hard to translate it into English, but the, the key word here is kapore, which is a kind of um, uh, scapegoat, right? Or a kind of a vicarious sacrifice. Um, and in Yiddish, that's a, a pretty common phrase, a kapor zeltir may you be punished instead of me and, um, and the whole Jewish people. So essentially the bridal couple is standing in for, for everyone else in some way or another. And uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second. That's a pretty, a pretty important phrase in my analysis of the meaning of the cholera wedding. Uh, let me go back for a second to uh, to this slide here, there's another, uh, another explanation that we can offer for the cholera wedding, which is that, um, and this was an explanation that was sometimes given at the time, that it was important for people to, to raise their spirits at a time of terrible disease, especially because there was, um, there was an idea that was prevalent at the time that if you were fearful or anxious, that you would be more susceptible to cholera. 
which we know in our own day in a slightly modified form, right? We, we know the idea that we have to keep our spirits up. We have to keep our mental health uh, good uh, because depression can lead to uh, a lower immune immune system and um, and and then we may we become sick not necessarily with COVID-19 but uh, more generally we, one wants to keep one's spirits up which has been pretty important over the last 10-11 um, months and we know that in various places in Europe and Paris and Britain we have all kinds of reveling going on during the cholera uh, epidemic and it's possible that the cholera wedding in the cemetery in Eastern Europe was another aspect of this kind of reveling, especially because we know that, uh, as I told you earlier, usually the, or very often, the, um, uh, the wedding itself was kind of an excuse for people to make merry. Uh, and we have a, a, an explanation which hints at this, uh, more than hints at this, from a, uh, a book by a rabbi by the name of Meir Yechiel Lipitz uh, from the late 19th century. This is a book of explanation of minhagim, of customs. And the cholera wedding is in here as one of the customs that's being explained. Um, sakana. So everyone attends the wedding in the cemetery in a celebration of mass joy and music and much happiness to arouse happiness in the masses so that they not be sad, which is a great danger in this matter, so that they not be afraid and become accustomed to the cemetery and not fear death. So there's a kind of, there's a religious explanation here, which is people should not fear death and therefore that's why we go to the cemetery. And then there's a, I, I would argue, a kind of a magical uh, magical slash medical explanation, which is that you have to make people uh, happy so that they are not susceptible to the disease. So <clears throat> going back to the question of the kapore, that phrase that I mentioned, that, that, that word that I mentioned earlier, which is part of the part of that Purim spiel. Um, elsewhere in my book, I argue that mar the marginalized people in the Jewish community often serve as a scapegoat. There's other, um, there's other evidence of that. Obviously, we have the Purim spiel evidence. May you both be punished. Uh, we know that during the, um, the very severe conscription regime of Jewish men and boys under Nicholas I in the starting in 1827, um, which is, of course, only a few years before the 1831 pandemic, we have a folk song that refers to uh, an only child who's drafted into the army, the only child of a, of a widow, as a scapegoat. And you can see here, tears flow in the streets, one could wash oneself in children's blood. What a misfortune is this, will dawn never come again? Klein Eufelech. I'm reading there the fifth and sixth lines. They drag little chicks from Cheder. They dress them in military uniforms. Um, and that means our elders and our rabbis help to force them into military service, which is a whole other chapter here, a very tragic chapter, when the Jewish community itself was forced by the Tsarist government to present the conscription lists to the military. So they, the Jews themselves had to choose which men, which boys would be drafted. And of course, you may know they were drafted for 25 years. And if they were drafted before the age of 18, then they had to wait till they were, till they were drafted. And then once they turned 18, that's when the 25 year clock began. Now, Zushi Rakover has seven sons. Presumably, he's a, he's a wealthy guy, or at least, at least comfortable, but not one was drafted. Um, but Leah, the widow's only son, nor Leah de Almonas ain't sick akin, these are the last lines, is made to pay the price for the kahal sins. Is a kapore for kol shazind. And you could also translate that as that Leah, the widow's only son, is a scapegoat for the kahal's treachery. So we have here again this word kapore, 
the um, the marginal person, I would argue, right? This is someone who's poor. Uh, a, the woman is a widow. She's certainly not um, a central character in the Jewish community. And her son is the one who is the kapore. And we find that in other cases as well uh, during this period of conscription. So I'm suggesting that the bride and groom function symbolically as substitute victims for the epidemic and that the community is essentially saying to them that um, they, they hope that the epidemic will, or the evil of the epidemic will uh, be transferred from the community as a whole onto the scapegoat, onto the kapore of the bride and the group. Um, and I really like this, um, this illustration that you can see here. Um, I think it's charcoal of a wedding in the cemetery because, especially because of the, um, the expressions on the faces of the bride and the groom, um, which uh, suggest um, dismay, um, anxiety, shock. Uh, and, and that was certainly uh, very often how they were feeling because they had no say in the matter from most of the evidence that we have. They were simply pressed into service when the time came and they were told this was what this is what was going to happen, um, and they were essentially used by the community for its own purposes. And the way this connects to the larger argument of the book is that, generally speaking, not only here in this instance of the collar wedding, these outcasts or these marginal people came to serve as a symbol for East European Jewry as a whole. And here I'm I'm quoting myself because um, I. I'm, I'm like what I wrote in the book and it, uh, I may as well use it again, a kind of doppelganger onto which the mainstream of Jewish society could project its own fears and anxieties about Jews and their place in the modern world. So because they serve as this symbol uh, for the entire people, they can also serve as the, out, as the, uh, as the scapegoat because it, it is hoped in a very, uh, very symbolic way that the epidemic will, um, will land on them. And not that anyone is saying explicitly, we hope you get cholera, that's not what's happening at all. Um, it's, I'm talking on the purely symbolic kind of anthropological level of what seems to be going on, on, uh, you know, on a very profound, in a very profound way on the level of meaning with this ritual. Now, as we move forward in time, especially um, in the, the very late 19th century and the early 20th century with the, the rise of Jewish politics, um, Zionism, for example, Bundism, um, the rise of the Jewish literary Renaissance, both in Hebrew and in Yiddish, um, what we find is that this outcast, the figure of the outcast, the marginal person, uh, changes and rather than being seen as uh, as a negative representation of the Jewish community as a whole is often seen much more sympathetically. Um, and we know, for example, that both Zionism and Bundism often characterize the Jewish people as a whole, especially the Jews in Eastern Europe, as uh, as weak, as vulnerable, as, uh, as beggars, as orphans, right? That was kind of their, the uh, metaphoric or symbolic representation of the Jewish people. And of course, their idea was that they had to be transformed, they had to be lifted up by the, uh, by the new political movements. Uh, and so they, they use the symbol of the, uh, the outcast in a very, very effective way. Um, in literature, Sure. As well, we see that uh, that that symbol that symbol being used in uh, I, uh, the people I uh, I look at in the um, in the book. The authors that I look at are uh, Yudlamit Peretz, the great Yiddish writer, um, and Agnon, the great Hebrew writer. Um, and I also look at film, and uh, one of the best films to represent this particular. Uh, trend is Fischke der Krumer, 
which is called, for some reason, The Light Ahead in English. This is a Yiddish film that was made in 1939. Um, and I have a clip to show you from the film. The film actually uh, shows a cholera wedding. Um, we have the protagonists, Fishke, Fishke the Lame, and Hodel, who is blind. Uh, and they are sweethearts. But uh, the, the town elders don't know that. And a pandemic comes to town, and they decide that they're going to they decide that they're going to uh, conduct a cholera wedding and marry uh, Fishka and Huddle to each other. Um, and if you give me just a couple seconds, I will try to uh, to connect you with that film strip. Just bear with me, please. This always takes a minute. <laughs> Can you see anything yet? try this a different way. Okay. In der River Fischke at Stuttgart Schloss. Wir machen der Chassene mit Halate Schiedisch Mädel. Wir stellen der Krippe auf dem Besäulem. Im Beschrise wird ins Gott helfen, in stillen Sandsorgen. Alatische jüdische Tochter, wo sie zu Karin drehen, ein Buche glatter Säu, wo sie da Tachle sogar lehm Fischke. Ein sehr gutes Mädel. Amar, Amar, aber zu dem hat er Segel. Aber wer hat er Segel? Wer das Mädel ist, fragst du? Ja, wer? Die Blinde ist so immer Udele. Udele? Mhm. Tomme wird sie nicht wählen? Wo sei sie wird nicht wählen? Tomme wird sie suchen, hat sie will nicht? Sie will nicht? Ich will nicht. Ich will nicht. Udele, es ist doch ein sehr großes Mitzweh. In der Ziffer der ganzen Stadt, die als euch kennst du, sagt auf viele Hupen zu gehen. Lasst mich ab! Lasst mich ab! Was hat ihr so hingesetzt durch meine Jungen? Sie hat sich den schönen Lärm, die Gesäume. Darf mir schon verzaffen, mein Blöd? In ihrer Gemeinverkehr, sie wird seit ihr Gosam hingelegt, wo sie stut, will ihr Ziehwerk in den Korn. Aber was wusste denn ihr Herr, dass in alle andere jüdische Töchter? Was wusste das Kind mit uns in der Sache habe? Was habe ich so hin? Ich hasse nur machen aus dem Besäumen. Ich habe Mäuren. Sie darf nicht gemäuern. Ich will die Ruf sprechen. Und Gott wird dir helfen. Zu der Sache mit Masseln, mit Brüche. In der kriegst du schöne Katze in der Matunne. Was sagen Sie? Ja, die Matunne hat mir so stellen. Ich hab... Was war das schrecklich? Ich will dich. Ich will Nein, 
Okay, and now we're going to go to the wedding scene. Dein Nudel ist gewinn gerecht, wenn es das gewollt hat, weg von der Sache tut. Wo es lebt noch, also wie im Mittelalter, wo es meinen, als mit Tabakloben, wenn sie Putter wären von der Karriere. Ah, Dank. Ein großen Dank, Herr Schreib Mendel. Ihr seid gewinn wie ein eigener Tafelzünd. Ein großen Dank. Schreib Mendel. Ich sehe ja, ihr geht hart. Ja, Kind. Die sehe ich. Die bist nicht blind. Weil du bist glücklich. So, as you can see, the uh, the protagonists here, the outcasts, are played by two of the most beautiful actors uh, on the Yiddish stage, um, and they're the ones who are morally superior. They have to escape from this. Uh, from this town, which is mired in medieval superstition, as their friend, um, as their friend says at the end, um, and Hudel is told specifically, "You are not blind, right? You aren't blind because you are because you're happy. So if you can manage to find true love um, and then escape from your conditions, then you're." Or you can actually, in some ways, lift yourself up out of um, uh, out of your depressed condition, um, out of your marginal state, and that's very much the uh, the message of uh, many of the um, the political movements that I was talking about earlier. Um, 
And you see here a, a very different take um, on the cholera wedding, of course, and on the marginal people as a whole. And um, Fishka and Hodel are the ones who have the last laugh on that, um, that morally base shtetl. Uh, by the way, I want to go back for a, for a minute to um, uh, something that I suggested early on today, which is uh, the idea of poor people or the underclass rising up in some way against the authorities during a pandemic. Um, and although in this case, in the movie, it's the, um, the community authority, the community elders who decide there's going to be a, 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 a cholera wedding, the scene I didn't show you is when the oh, the Opsprecherin, the ma the ma the magician essentially, the, the the woman who serves as the magical ritual expert who you who you saw in one of the scenes, um, she comes to the kahal to the governing board of the community and she says, "There's cholera in the town, and what we have to do is a cholera wedding." So she's the one who suggests it, and then they say, "Okay, we need to do that." Um, and in many cases, it seems that it really was these ritual experts, often women or older women, who suggested that the collar wedding needed to take place. And um, especially in the early years of the collar wedding, we know that the local rabbis and communal authorities did not want it to happen. They didn't like the idea of the collar wedding. Um, and certainly the medical experts said that it was a superstition, as you can imagine, people associated with the Haskalah, with the Jewish Enlightenment uh, progressives, they were horrified by this superstition. But the kind of ordinary folk said, we want to have a cholera wedding. You know, we don't care for your, your, uh, your medical uh, explanations, your medical interventions, they don't work anyway. And we're going to have our good old fashioned religion and that you might see in a certain way as a rebellion within the Jewish community against established medical authority. It's not quite the same as what happens in the violent uh, riots that I mentioned earlier, but it may be something along, uh, along similar lines. Um, now I'm going to, to end with um, a reference to the new plague wedding, the new cholera wedding of 2020, um, which took place in March of this year. Um, I had thought that we had seen the last of the, of the cholera wedding uh, when it took place, as I mentioned, um, during the Holocaust, but in fact, it was revived in B'nai Brak. Um, apparently, the groom in this case was an, an orphan, um, not, the, not the bride, so it wasn't really a full a full collar wedding as it would have been practiced earlier. Um, but uh, nonetheless, you can see the black, uh, the black chopa. You can see that it's taking place in the cemetery. In this case, it's in the Panovej Cemetery in, in B'nai Brak. Um, and as to my knowledge, there hasn't been one since. But uh, unfortunately, we're not done with this pandemic yet. So who knows? We, we may see more of these kinds of things. In any case, what's, uh, what's important for my purposes is the, uh, the extent to which this ritual is so powerful that it can essentially last, persist for almost two centuries, uh, even after a long period of being quote unquote dormant uh, and, and not appearing at all. Um, you know, we don't, we don't see it, for example, in you know, the late 20s and the 30s, then we don't see it again after World War II for, for many, many decades, and then it makes an appearance again. So it's a, it's a ritual with incredible power. Um, as I've tried to explain to you today, it has many, many layers to it. Um, some aspects of it are, uh, I think, are not praiseworthy at all. Um, and yet there is still, in theory, the element of charity, which, which is powerful for many people as well. Uh, and so I don't think we've seen the last of this ritual yet um, in the Jewish world. So thanks for your attention. Uh, everyone and I look forward to uh, your and discussion. Wonderful. What a fascinating talk, really, in terms of there were so many dimensions to it. Um, the religious, the magical, the 
communal aspects and the troubling aspects of the mocking of these people. One of the questions that came up, you addressed already, which was, were there not rabbis who objected to that kind of behavior, that base behavior of mocking the marginalized and the disabled? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yes, I can. Uh, generally, I've, I've, I and colleagues of mine have looked for specific references to the collar wedding in um, halachic literature in particular. And there's very, very few references. So either, either rabbis didn't know about it, which is unlikely, or they decided to ignore it, which I think is more likely. Um, and we know that in some cases, as I mentioned, especially in the earlier period, so I'm talking here about the 1860s, we know that there were local rabbis who tried to dissuade the people from carrying out this wedding, um, or they had to be persuaded to officiate at the wedding. But then once we get to the 1890s, we hear that the um, that the the local rabbi, the Mar de Atra, or you know who, whoever whoever it happened to be, um, in some cases it might have been a, a Hasidish uh, Rebbe, uh, did officiate at the wedding, and um, and in fact we know that in some cases the the ra the rabbinic and the communal leadership were the ones who came up with the idea of the wedding. So it, it seems to have gradually over time sunk in as an acceptable kind of um, an acceptable fallback, right? An acceptable remedy for uh, for a cholera wedding uh, for for the cholera. Um, I, I know that in in one particular case there was a chuva where a, where a rabbi did. I don't remember who it was, but a rabbi did mention the cholera wedding, and um, generally the concern was was much more for the logistical details of. Uh, whether Kohanim could attend, you know, whether co whether priests, Kohens could, could attend because it's in the cemetery, there didn't seem to be much question of whether or not uh, one could actually carry out this, uh, this ritual. So it seems to have generally been accepted, maybe in part because popular feeling was so much behind the wedding that it would have been very difficult, politically speaking, for a local rabbi to oppose it. Um, it, basically, he would have been going against almost everyone in the town, at least from at least from the evidence that we have. Thank you. Um, in the film, Huddle expresses concern that their children would be ostracized. Kathy Felix asks, "Do we know, indeed, if children were ostracized?" We don't have a lot of evidence about what happened to the couple afterwards. There's a, a few few references to, uh, to the couple being taken care of by the town afterwards, which is an ambiguous statement because it could also mean that they were, they continued to be given charity as beggars, right? I mean, that, that could, it doesn't mean that, that they were given an, a, a house and kept in comfort for the rest of their lives. And usually that's not at all the case. Um, if we do hear about kids afterwards, usually what we hear is that the family is begging together. So we hear about the, the couple having married, then they continue to beg together. Um, and then ultimately they have children and the, the children are beggars. So it, basically it, it, the cycle of marginalization persists, um, which Makes sense, right? I mean, if you marry two marginal people to, to each other, then that's probably what you're going to get in that kind of traditional society. There's a, a, a story that takes place during the interwar period in the, in the 20s or the 30s where uh, it's suggested that things go a little bit better for at least the older child because um, by the time we get into the interwar period in Poland, we have very sophisticated well, social welfare networks um, that have orphanages and uh, educational institutions that can care for such people, or at least the, the children of such people. So there's a glimmer of hope by the time we get to a later period, but still pretty gloomy. Thank you. Um, did this ritual work? In fact, one would think that the 
plague that was ongoing would have continued even after the ritual? What do we know about that? How did the community respond if the plague continued? Well, my theory is that because the, the collar wedding was seen as a remedy of last resort, um, that by the time they carried it out, the epidemic had already killed many people in a particular town. And um, at some point it peters out, right? At some point, um, I don't know if it's herd immunity or what exactly, but uh, you know, it's, it's kind of killed all the people that it's going to kill. And so my guess is that th that happened right around the same time so that once they did the cholera wedding, and of course we know, according to, you know, when people do magic, you're going to try to justify it or rationalize it somehow. So, you, you know, whether it goes away the next day or a few weeks later, you can say, well, it ended. So thank God it ended. And we know why it was because we, we conducted the cholera wedding. Thank you. Uh, Elaine Khan had a question about why the ceremony was so rare. And I'm wondering if we could add to that question, you know, how is it that one community, one community conveyed to other communities that this ritual was a practice? Well, uh, my, my point is, I don't think it was rare at all. Um, in the six, from the 60s, from the 1860s into the 1890s, and then e even into the early 20th century, we, I have dozens and dozens of, of um, occurrences of the cholera wedding across Eastern Europe. And as I mentioned, also in Eretz Israel, also in the United States. Um, and there are probably many more that we don't have records of. So I, I think that, I mean, how exactly it, uh, how exactly it, the knowledge of the cholera wedding made its way from one person to another, that has to do with, with networks of, uh, of, of oral wisdom and magic uh, that I think have a lot to do with, um, with women's networks mm -hmm. that were generally oral. This is another project, a new project that I'm working on right now, um, the question of magic in East European Jewish culture, which was very widespread. Um, obviously most rabbis frowned on it, um, but it was common knowledge that you could go to the local, uh, the local well, usually older woman who had uh, magical knowledge and you could get the evil eye taken off. You could get the evil eye put on to someone else. Um, you could have, you know, there were all kinds of cures and these were kind of interwoven with uh, folk knowledge of Kabbalah as well. Um, and, you know, these, these networks, I mean, you know, e Eastern European Jews, they were pretty mobile you know, uh, families married with other families in other towns, sometimes not close by. Letters were sent back and forth. So, you know, there were all kinds of ways for people to find out about these rituals and for that kind of, uh, that kind of knowledge to spread. Thank you. Um, Peter had a question saying that many are familiar with the concept of Kaparis from Yom Kippur and wondering, you know, if there's a connection there as a long standing Jewish ritual applied in this case that you described. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, you're probably familiar with the ritual of the, uh, the biblical ritual of the Seir La Azazel, the, the, the scapegoat, literally the scapegoat in, um, in biblical account that we read on Yom Kippur, upon whom the sins of the people were symbolically placed and sent out to the wilderness, right? And, um, uh, and so the idea of the kapore or kapore, shlogun kapores, which is uh, the, the Ashkenazi ritual of taking the, the chicken on the eve of Yom Kippur and hoisting it above one's head and then symbolically one's sins are transferred to, to the chicken. That, of course, you know, that idea goes back the very long way in Judaism. And you can find that same idea in many other religious traditions, the, the idea of placing one's sin symbolically upon someone else. There's a, um, there's a tradition um, among the Welsh, it's not practiced anymore, but it was in the 19th century and earlier, uh, someone called a sin eater. And that was a person who um, would symbolically take upon himself or herself, I'm not sure if it was, if it was women as well, um, the sins of a person who had just died. And that was a 
uh, and he would do that by eating a symbolic meal at a particular point during the, 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 the burial uh, ritual. And then it was understood that the sins had actually been transferred to that person. So this is something that we know that is common in human society. Thank you. You ready to keep going for a bit? We've got some Yeah, yeah, questions. definitely, sure. Right, okay. So um, Michael Lieben asks, um, he, he's read a story by the Yiddish writer Bluma Lempel. And uh, in that story, a wedding takes place in a cemetery. And he wonders if these uh, occurred only in the context of cholera or in other contexts as well. Um, so my knowledge of the this plague wedding and really the, the what it was called in Yiddish is magei fechasana usually, which is the with the plague wedding. Um, and so it only took place during uh, during epidemics. So as I mentioned, cholera and then later on typhus or Spanish flu, um, and then during the Holocaust, of course, there were um, there were terrible uh, terrible epidemics in the ghettos. Uh, there is, there's a couple mentions in one source that I have of, a, of um, plague weddings that were carried out in the 1920s because economic conditions were so bad for Jews. And that's very unusual because ordinarily it was only during, you know, during a time of disease that this was carried out. Um, uh, you know, Jews otherwise would not hold weddings in the cemetery. It was considered inappropriate to do that. It's, um, it's considered mocking the dead to hold a, a cemetery, uh, uh, I mean, according to, at least according to some interpretations, because you're doing something that the dead are not able to, uh, to do or to participate in. Um, there apparently was uh, some kind of rather rare ritual among Jews where, uh, and I don't have a lot of evidence for this, but if a groom died prematurely before the wedding, then there's, they may have done a certain kind of, of wedding. I don't know if it was in the cemetery or not, where the bride was brought to the chuppah by herself. Mm -hmm. And it was almost as if she was kind of, they were symbolically going through the wedding that, had, that was supposed to take place. If you're familiar with Ansky's Dibbuk, this is a, basically the theme of, of the Dibbuk where, uh, where the protagonist was supposed to be married to her love and then he dies prematurely. And then he comes back in the form of a Dibbuk and he possesses her. Um, I'm not familiar with that particular author, but I would love that reference because I'm trying to collect as, as many references as I can, as many sources as I can. So, um, so that's, I'm, I'm grateful for that particular, um, for that reference to the Yiddish story. Great, thank you. Uh, Judy Pikowski asks, why the ritual didn't move to Western Europe? You spoke about it as specifically in the Pale of Settlement and in the Russian Empire. Any insights about that? Of course, now we know that it moved to Bnei Brak and I understand also to Winnipeg not so long ago, but what yeah. about Western Europe? Well, um, so the reason that it moved to these other places, to, um, to Eretz Israel and to uh, North America is because they were significant populations of Ashkenazi, meaning Eastern European Jews in those places. So you needed to have the kind of um, socio-religious um, network of beliefs that underlay East European Jewish religiosity to have this wedding. Um, by the time we get to the 19th century, most Jews in Western Europe are already well on their way to um, acculturation, to um, a kind of Western mode of religiosity that many of us are familiar with, meaning I am a German of the Jewish faith. I'm a Frenchman of the Jewish faith. Um, I, don't, I don't believe in superstitions. Uh, you know, I go to a, a synagogue, I go to a synagogue or a temple where we look exactly like Christians do when they worship. So, one of the goals of the Enlightenment, or one of the goals of kind of the, the Jewish move towards Europeanization in Western Europe was to rid themselves of the medieval uh, accretions, as they saw it, of Judaism, right? They wanted a pure Judaism that would look like Protestant Christianity um, or even Catholic Christianity in some ways uh, um, in, in their contemporary societies. And so 
generally, although I'm sure the generations of German and French and uh, and Dutch and, and and British Jews, there were still you know magical or superstitious beliefs, but this would never have been permitted. This kind of thing, um, and and so it's only among the you know on traditional soil, so to speak, um, uh, where you have dense populations of, of East European Jews who are still in the main traditional in some way in their outlook. Um, now, of course, once you get to the, the 20th century and the 1920s and then the 1940s, the situation is somewhat different because at that point, you know, many Jews in Eastern Europe are already very modern in their outlook. Um, but nonetheless, some sort of, um, some sort of a traditional outlook and certainly memory of efficacious magical rituals remains, and that allows, I think, for the for the persistence of the ritual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Adrian Isikoff comments that this ritual reminds her of kind of other embraces of death in carnival, such as in Haiti and Mexico, the Mardi Gras. I wonder if you'd comment about that. Yes, absolutely. That there's some there's a, a part that I don't talk about in this particular talk, but I do in the chapter in the book, which is um, which is about the um, le danse macabre, which is the dance of the the dance of with the dance of the dead, um, and that's a tradition that seems to go back to the Middle Ages, possibly to the period of the Black Death. It's unclear exactly how it emerged. But there was some sort of old European tradition of, uh, of dancing with death, um, uh, in a, perhaps in a bid to, um, to stop death from taking so many victims or, for, or perhaps a, a, some, some other way of interacting with death, uh, kind of facing the fear of death head on instead of running away from it. And um, so we find that popping up in various European cultures from the Middle Ages onward. And that's a, a, an excellent point is that we find that also in these ritualized celebrations like carnival where death becomes personified. Usually you have someone who, who actually is dressed up as the angel of death and then people take turns dancing with that character. And, um, and I do think that there's something of the danse macabre among the in the collar wedding itself, because obviously, as you could tell from the film, right, you have people dancing on among the graves. Like there's, you know, it's, it's pretty obvious that that there's some sort of perhaps even provocative interaction with um, with death, maybe sexualized in some way or another. That's something I also didn't talk about. That's another layer of the collar wedding, which is. The, um, the, the sexual element of it because the, um, the collar bride and the collar groom are usually people of advanced age, right? Mm -hmm. These are people who the outcast could not or uh, you know, generally were not able to get married. And so by the time they were married in this ritual, they usually tended to be in their late 20s, 30s, maybe even 40s. And there was a lot of suspicion of people who were not married in the shtetl. No, that that was not okay in traditional Jewish society. Everyone was married, right? I mean, if you were if you became widowed, for example, you were usually remarried within months. So to not be married at all was very very unusual. And um, my one of my theories is that there was a, a kind of sexual suspicion around these people. And um, and as I mentioned earlier, there were all generally there were traditional associations of epidemic and sexual immorality. So there, there's something else going on here as well. There may be a link to a belief, a Kabbalistic belief that um, Samael and Lilit, so in other words, Satan and his, and his wife reside in the cemetery. And uh, of course there's endless sexual fascination with Lilith in Jewish tradition. So there's, there's, all, there's a whole other element here that we could talk about that uh, that involves that aspect of um, of the ritual. Fascinating. Okay, we'll take two more questions, I think. So um, Beverly Luchfeld mentioned, it's actually not a question, but a comment, but I think you'll have something to say about it, which is, again, I would read into it a kind of magical uh, hope that in Muncie magazines currently, 
there are organizations that say they will have they will cure Ayn Hara. <laughs> the can I can show the the pictures of them of all the ads. I my husband collected them. Um, yeah, it's uh, that doesn't surprise me at all. Um, you know, I I grew up. Uh, with my with my grandmother of blessed memory saying um, Kenahara all the time. You know, I didn't know what it meant. I just knew that she said it. And then later on, I understood that she was saying, may there be no evil eye. Um, and that, you know, I'm sure many of us have that have that experience. And it's, it's just a, an aspect of Judaism that, um, as I mentioned earlier, with regard to Western Europe, our westernized somewhat purified if you like form of judaism uh has been stripped of and may maybe for the better maybe for the worse i don't know but there is an, an a very very thick layer of judaism which has to do with what we would consider magic right and uh and also uh spirits the next world Right, all of that. I mean, traditional people tended to, and still today, I suppose, in traditional communities, um, you live with an understanding that the world that you see is only the outer layer, and that there's all, all kinds of things going on underneath everything. Uh, you know, ruches, shading, you know, all kinds of, um, all kinds of. Uh, spirits and demons. Um, I don't really know. I mean, the, the Ein Hara is one thing, right? Evil eye, that, that I know there's a, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's still persistent belief about that in traditional Jewish communities. Um, I'm not sure about the, uh, about the belief in demons and in um, Dibuk and so on and so forth, but my, my suspicion is, that if we go into, um, again, it's less the scholarly circles, right? You're not going to find Rabbeim in Litvish communities or, or even, you know, Tzadikim in Hasidic communities saying, you know, you need to watch out for, uh, for demons. They, 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 may, they may discuss it, but generally they're not going to talk, I think, in very open ways about it. But I think it still persists among women probably and uh, and other circles as well um, i know that in the mizrahi community in israel there's still a tremendous belief in the power of holy men um, and their ability to do miracles vis-a-vis -vis the um, the spirit world and and demons um, and and dibuks and so on and so forth so this hasn't at all disappeared within judaism in some cases it's kind of gone sub rosa but uh but i think it's still pretty powerful at least in some communities mm -hmm. great thank you so i hope i got to everyone's questions at least most of them uh tani i, I really your uh, presentation was outstanding and i feel that i'm sure everybody does you really have mastered making a lecture on zoom so engaging with the slides and the illustrations and the film snippet, you really kept us with you the whole time. And that was great. And um, Dennis Klein, one of the chairpersons of Adult Ed, uh, made the comment that it's just great to have the next generation of Beth Shalom um, members, children of members so engaged. And I know that you've been on Kabbalah Shabbat with the community, even though you're at a geographic distance, it is another benefit of Zoom that you can be with us and part of us. And that made it even more special. So um, I'm getting a lot of comments, which I hope you can see in the chat too, about how incredibly interesting your talk was and how glad we are to have sponsored it. And I want to say this was um, a first step for us in increasing daytime programming at a time when so many of us are still spending a great deal of time at home. Uh, it was co-sponsored by Hazak and Adult Education. 
and a real opportunity. And at its peak today, we had more than 60 people uh, participating, which I think is really terrific. So thank you so much. Sure. I'm so uh, glad. And I can I put just... in a plug for people, we'll go to Amazon <laughs> and purchase it where it is. No, no, don't go to Amazon. Go okay. to Stanford University Press. I just dropped it in the chat. Great. Um, the site. And if you use a special code that I will give to you right now, it's a magical code that's only going to work for <laughs> <laughs> for the next year or two. Okay. If you use the code MITYEAR20, you can get 20% off. Excellent. So if, you wanna, if you don't, if you want to buy it, go to Stanford University Press and not Amazon. Okay. But thank you so much for, for having me. I really, really appreciate yeah. it. And the, the, the questions were absolutely good. fantastic. Really good questions and a marvelous talk. So again, Thank you so much. It was really a treat and um, just a wonderful learning opportunity. So thank you everyone for participating, for staying with us through this time. And we'll look forward to offering more programs during the day. And again, Tani, any time that you can be with us, we're most grateful and appreciative. Super, okay. thanks a lot. Every, I, I hope everyone uh, stays healthy and well. Indeed, and best wishes for a good and healthy new year. I think we can all at least hold on to greater optimism <laughs> and hopefulness that 2021 will be a better year for all.